More on the pyramids, and we talk with Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins about human and chimp genetics. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, Genesis Week is the show of choice for intelligent people who make use of their intelligently designed brains. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, that's the show, where you can find us and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. A whole whack of viewers sent me articles from Gizmodo and The Blaze asking if perhaps this recent research had stolen our thunder and explaining how the Egyptians built the pyramids. A very interesting paper written by a multinational team came out in Physical Review Letters, where they conducted experiments on sliding a sledge across wet and dry sand. Now, this research was inspired by a pictograph from the tomb of Diehutihotep. I probably butchered that pronunciation. The pictograph shows the transporting of a very large statue depicting some 172 men pulling it on a sledge. It also shows what appeared to be people possibly carrying bags of something and one man pouring what was understood to be water in front of the sledge. Now this has all been known for quite some time now. However, this paper actually conducted experiments to see how water and sand would affect the energy required to move heavy weights on a sledge. Now, most scholars had simply assumed that the pictograph was strictly an approximation of what they did, and that it would require many, many more than 172 men to pull such a weight. Scholars have generally believed that the ancient Egyptians did not have the wheel. Now, this assumption is rooted in two sources. One, evolutionism, which infers that the ancients, evolving from stupid apes, became more intelligent over time, and thus humans would have to invent the wheel, instead of the wheel being an obvious no-brainer tool that would be simply used intuitively, no discovery or inventing required. And two, depictions like this one, which show the use of sledges, not wheeled carts. Well, just because they used a sledge doesn't mean they didn't have the wheel. They probably had their reasons for using a sledge to move such a large statue, just as many people today, in modern times, use a sledge. If a modern person uses a sledge, does that mean they don't have the knowledge or intelligence to use a wheel? Well, of course not. That's a non sequitur. In fact, what this paper shows is that the ancients had a lot of intelligence. The pictograph shows a man pouring what is accepted to be water immediately in front of the sledge. Now, this subtlety in the pictograph turns out to be a critical part of the moving process. What the researchers discovered was that dry sand tends to build up in front of the sledge, making it harder to move the sledge. Adding too much water to the sand actually made it harder still to move the sledge. But adding just the right amount of water, about 5%, decreased the force needed in half. Notice what has happened in this research. The ancients did something we didn't know or understand, which inspired an in-depth scientific study by physicists to learn what it was the ancients knew that we didn't know. But there's more to the picture. Yes, they use sledges to move large objects, like statues, but contrary to what has been suggested by Gizmodo and the Blaze, this does not solve the mystery of moving the 2.3 million blocks that make up the Pyramid of Giza. Remember, conservatively, they would have to cut, 
transport, and in place within the pyramid construction, at least 250 blocks per day, each of which weighed close to three tons. We will be revealing how these Egyptians performed this feat, as well as several other mysteries in our upcoming documentary. Now, it was formerly called Mystery of Noah's Flood, but due to possible title conflicts with another documentary, we have renamed it to The Noah Flood, A Changed World. Please pray for Stephen and I as we venture out shortly to get all of the footage needed for final production. We're going to show not only how incredibly intelligent the ancients like Noah were, but also just how feasible it was for only four men to build the ark. You can still follow along and support the project at noahflood.com or the original mysteryofnoahsflood.com website. John wrote into our Facebook page, Ian, do a show on the 2Q13 fusion site. This argument for fusion is so lame it's unbelievable. John is referring to the alleged biological fusion of two chromosomes in humans. To shed some light on this wide-ranging topic, I am joined by Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins via Skype from his office in Dallas. Dr. Tompkins has a PhD in genetics, as well as a master's in plant science, and a bachelor's in agriculture. While working as a faculty member in the Department of Genetics and Biochemistry at Clemson University for over a decade, he performed genomics research in plants, animals, and microbial genomes. He is now a research scientist at ICR. He has 56 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals and seven book chapters in scientific books. Since coming to ICR, he has 15 publications in peer-reviewed creation science journals. He is the primary author of The Design and Complexity of the Cell. Welcome to the show, Dr. Tompkins. Thank you. It's great to be on. Now, your expertise is in genetics, and whenever I have given a talk, uh, I like to poll the audience and ask how many people have heard that humans and chimps are 98.5% identical genetically. And right. invariably, it's a lot of people, uh, usually about half the audience, and these are just lay people. So obviously, the propaganda machine has been working like a well-oiled machine. Now, you conducted research with Dr. Jerry Bergman into the published scientific literature. What did you actually find that contradicted this paradigm? Well, that's where we, we first started, or I first started, and I, I linked up with Jerry Bergman, a biologist and biochemist, and we found out that by studying the scientific literature that these 98% claims are based on very small fragments of the genome that are compared. And in fact, with my background in bioinformatics, I could go into these papers, look at the materials and methods, and see where they threw out sequence, or what sequence was it you know, thrown out or omitted by the algorithm. Because there are certain sections of the genome that just don't align up. There's, there are sections of the genome that are present in humans, absent in chimps, present in chimps, absent in humans, or there's large gaps in the sequence that the algorithm doesn't really go through. It stops. And so I was able to look at all these regions of the genome that all these different papers looked at. And I, we found out that it varied, but when you threw back in the, the DNA sequence that was tossed out, that the average similarity for a lot of these papers varied, depending on the paper, varied between 66% all, all the way up to 86% similarity. And so what you're getting really is just this cherry-picked data. You're not getting all the DNA sequence added in that, that should have been added in to give you an overall similarity. And another thing that these papers did was they only looked at a lot of times just what are called exon sequences or protein coding sequences in the genome which is in humans, it's about 2% of the entire genome. And, and also, they would only look at the protein coding sequences that were present in both genomes. And actually, what I've found out, and we'll talk about maybe a little later, is that close to 7% of the protein coding sequences in the human genome are totally missing in chimpanzees. So, yeah, on average, the chimpanzee genome is only about 70% similar to human. And this is, the study I did was probably the most painstaking bioinformatics study that's ever been done on the subject. And it really just confirmed what, what was already known anyways, but not really talked about. So your study covered the entire genome and not just that 2% of protein coding DNA, is that correct? 
That's correct. I studied the entire chimpanzee genome chromosome by chromosome. And I'm actually doing the same thing right now. I haven't published this data yet, but now I'm doing the other the other side of that comparison because that's just asymmetric. You're comparing chimp against human. Now I'm actually comparing human against chimpanzee. And I'm not only just comparing every single human chromosome, but I'm also looking at the coat the coding regions. I'm looking at what are called the promoter regions or the control regions in front of genes. And I'm also doing this very systematically so we can really see what regions of the genome are the most similar, how similar they are. And so when I get done with this current study, it's going to, to sort of be the end all <laughs> genome wide comparisons. But I don't think it will really tell us a, a whole lot. That, that should we prove already an interesting study. Did. No, it'll just kind of confirm things. So, uh, for the sake of viewers, you, you mentioned comparing chimp to human, and now you're going to compare right. human to chimp. Uh, human the to reason chimp. being because chimps have orphan genes, genes that humans don't have, and vice versa. Humans have genes that chimps don't and have. And vice versa, right. Which is the reason why you need to compare it both ways. Right. And of course, the chimp, the chimp genome is actually biased because it, it is and still is being assembled based on the human genome as a framework. Because in DNA sequencing, you can only sequence little pieces of DNA at a time, and then you have to assemble those sequences into contiguous uh, sets of overlapping sequence, and eventually you hope to actually reconstruct entire chromosomes. And so they have assembled the chimp genome, the chimpan, uh, the, not only the chimpanzee genome, but the orangutan genome and the gorilla genomes and the macaque genomes based on the human genome. And they're still doing this. There's a paper published in 2013, and I looked at the materials and methods, which actually weren't in the paper. You had to dig somewhere else for those. But they were actually assembling all these eight genomes based on the human genome, and not just any human genome, but the 2006 version of the human <laughs> genome, <laughs> which is what? It's 2014 now, right? <laughs> so this was eight, an eight-year-old version of the human genome, but they had to be consistent because the original version of the chimpanzee genome in 2005 used this essentially this version of it. It's called HG18. We're now on what's called version HG19. Now, uh, tied in with that, yeah. the anti-creationists have loudly touted what they call chromosomal fusion as proof positive that humans and chimps shared a common ancestor. So basically, our DNA is wrapped up in these bundles called chromosomes. We have 46 pairs of chromosomes, whereas the chimpanzees and the great apes have 48. And so because we were supposed to have branched off from an ape-like creature, the evolutionists have proposed that two chromosomes from our ancient ape-like ancestor fused together when we humans evolved. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Miller touted this. Uh, I want to read this quote. This is what he said at a lecture given at Case Western University back in 2006. Uh, in fact, Miller was very much gloating over his recent victory against the intelligent design camp. And this chromosomal fusion was one of his primary weapons. Quote, What must have happened is that one pair of chromosomes must have gotten fused. So we should be able to look at our genome and discover that one of our chromosomes resulted from the fusion of two primate chromosomes. So we should be able to look around our genome. You know what? If we don't find it, evolution is wrong. We don't share a common ancestor. End quote. He then went on to claim that recent research had found this fusion site exactly where evolution predicted it would be found on chromosome number two. What have you to say on this? Uh, basically, humans have 48 chromosomes, apes have 46. So based on what are called banding patterns of chromosomes, which are observed under a light microscope, and these are actually condensed chromosomes during a certain part of the cell cycle, not what you would normally find during a, a living cell that's actually functioning in your body. But in these condensed chromosomes, they stained them and then looked at the patterns in the chromosomes under a light microscope. And there were some banding patterns that were similar uh, between some human and ape chromosomes. So they thought these smaller ape chromosomes fused to form human chromosome two. Well, then in 19, and this was in 1982, then in 1991, 
they actually found what they thought was a fusion site, but it wasn't what they were expecting. It was a different pattern than what they have found in living mammals that had actually undergone a chromosome fusion. It did not, con it did not contain something called satellite DNA. So in living mammalian fusions, they find sat satellite DNA combined with satellite DNA or satellite DNA combined with telomere DNA, but they never find telomere-telomere fusions. It's never been heard of. So if it actually did happen in humans, it would be the first such case. And anyways, this fusion site consisted of these telomere sequences, but it was very small. Human telomeres contain 10,000 to 15,000 bases of this sequence. And this so in other words, if you were to find such a, a fusion, you would expect something about 20,000 to 30,000 bases in length. But this fusion, site, this fusion site was only about 800 bases in length, and it was only about 70% similar to what would be a pristine fusion. So it was highly yeah, degraded. Cause they, yeah, because they found so, these alleged fusion sites all over the place in other chromosomes, right? Well, it turns out that, that internal telomere sequences are found all over the human genome. And there's actually been papers published on this in the past few years. And it turns out many of these sites are performing functional things in the genome. They're binding to things called transcription factors, which, which initiate the, a, a gene or cause a gene to begin to be copied into RNA. And as it turns out, in my research, the fusion site is actually read in what's called the reverse complement, and it's a transcription factor binding site in the middle of a gene called DDX11L2, which is an RNA helicase, uh, long non-coding RNA gene. So it doesn't code for a protein. It codes for a functional RNA molecule that's active in the genome. And it turns out this gene is highly uh, co-expressed with other genes that are highly critical to the cell cycle and signaling in what's called the extracellular matrix, or the area outside your cells where a lot of signaling and communications go on. And it turns out this gene is highly expressed in many different cells in the human body. So it's a very important gene, and it's linked to many other highly important genes as well. Wow. And they're finding out now that, the, yeah, that these things are critical for human health, growth, development, they're finding out that when many of these long non-coding RNA genes are mutated, that it leads to cancer, that it leads to developmental problems. And so these, this is actually the hottest area of research right now at the NIH and their funding mechanisms is these long non-coding RNA genes. So in our alleged ape ancestor, this chromosome would break into two breaking this critical gene in two, so the ape couldn't live. Well, what I'm saying is that you don't form new, highly functional, critical genes by, by <laughs> slamming together two chromosomes. And yes, that's a much better, better way to put it. <laughs> and what's really interesting is that there was a research group in 2002 that sequenced 600,000 bases of DNA surrounding this gene. And they actually reported that the fusion site was in what they called a pseudogene at the time which is the gene I'm talking about now, which we now know 12 years later is highly functional and critical to the human genome. But they actually reported this back in 2002, but no one was really talking about it. But they sequenced 600,000 bases of DNA surrounding this gene and found that it was in a gene-rich region. It was in a nest of other genes. And that none of these genes in this entire 600,000 bases are found in chimpanzee. Now that's a crucial so point. So they hypothesized, yes. It, it, so that, and of course my research showed that as well, but they hypothesized that all these genes got there by coming from other places in the human genome. <laughs> they didn't come from. They didn't come from chimpanzee. Uh, this is the evolutionary thinking, the mindset. They didn't come from chimpanzee because there was no comparison to make. So they just came from other places in the human genome. So they just some. They just somehow ended up there through different mechanisms, supposedly. But so isn't that a convenient story? Yes. Right. It's not one thing. It's another. <laughs> as far as I... So what would happen to me if this gene were removed? Well, it's difficult to study because this gene is not in primates, it's not, it's not in mice. And see, these are our model systems, especially the mouse model system is very important to studying human health and disease because if that same gene is in mouse, then we can knock out that gene and see what the effects are. 
but you can't really do that in humans or, or at least talk about it if you did. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, when, when we study human genes, we have to do it in a system like mouse where we can knock out the gene and mess it up and then see what happens. And so there's a lot of genes in humans that are not shared by other creatures, you know, especially lab study creatures, and we just really don't know what they do. We can associate those with disease. We can associate those with the expression of other genes and see what they're linked to in the genome. And so that's what I did. I went into the databases and and this and deciphered what other genes this gene was linked to, what other genes it was co-expressed with. And this is very solid data, actually, because it shows that, that this gene is linked to the expression of other genes, and it's very important. Uh, and in fact, this gene was linked to genes that are at the top of the pyramid of uh, many important processes in the cell. Now, after I discussed this paper on the show, we had one gentleman write in. He, he was very cordial, and I, I appreciate that but he was skeptical of your work. Enrique's argument was that the gene encompassing the fusion site did not produce any known protein. Well, my response to that is, is that we now know that there's over twice as many non-protein coding genes in the genome, which I just talked about called long non-coding RNAs that are highly important uh, to the function of the genome. They're just as important as protein coding genes. And so, his comments are made out of complete and total ignorance as to what and how the genome functions because we now know that, that long non-coding RNAs and non-coding RNAs are, are the key to understanding genome function. It's like the protein coding genes are building blocks and so these tend to be more similar among different creatures. But the non-coding parts of the genome that produce these non-coding RNAs are actually t more organism specific or what they call taxonomically restricted. And, and, and it's like these genes provide the metadata for the building blocks that are the protein coding genes to function. They sort of, and they do a lot of different things. These non-coding RNA genes are found in the nuclei. The products of them, the, the RNA products of them are found in the nucleus. Uh, they're found in the cytoplasm. Some of them are even exported outside the cell to other cells in structures called exosomes. So, so these non-coding RNAs do a whole plethora of, of things depending on the gene. And they're highly critical to the function of the cell. And like I said, this is the most important area of research right now in biomedical uh, genomics that's going on. And it's receiving the most funding. And it's part of the ENCODE project, what we call the ENCODE project. So they are critical right. life-supporting genes. Yeah, they have knocked out these long non-coding RNA genes. If, if they are, have similar counterparts in mice, they have knocked them out and, and actually found that many are lethal uh, and that they're highly important. And in fact, many of them have been associated with all sorts of, of different types of cancer in humans. All right, I know how much the viewers appreciate all, the, all this, as do I. Uh, so from all of us, thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. Well, thank you. It was great to be with you. You can get a copy of Dr. Tompkins' brand spanking new and educational book, The Design and Complexity of the Cell, from ICR. Now, this interview was edited for television, but you can catch the entire interview on our YouTube channel. Just head on over to genesisweek.com, which will take you there. Stick around. We'll be back in just one minute. Oh, not again! To the horror of both fans and enemies, Ian Juby is back with more ranting goodness. Okay, Jacques. You first. Just when you thought his meds had kicked in, Ian goes off on a tangent about what killed the dinosaurs. The origin of life, defining evolution, and yes, even sex. It wasn't enough for an R rating, but nowadays, what is? Volume 4 of his ever-popular and ever-hated Karevo rants has eight new short fast, funny, and hard-hitting episodes. You can get your copy on the soon-to-be-extinct DVD for 15 bucks plus shipping and handling, or purchase the instant digital download of all eight tracks for just eight bucks. Or you can buy all four volumes of his world-infamous rants for the price of three. Order your copies today and have a party with, like, popcorn and stuff. Visit Ian's bookstore today. for me?
In response to Creepo Rant number 135, peer review and creationists, Sloth Ape wrote in on YouTube. So, because the peer review process isn't perfect, creationists can dismiss it as worthless or irrelevant? How you got that message from what I said is beyond me. Did you forget I specifically mentioned decades of creationary peer review journals? Did you forget the multitudes of articles by creationists in secular peer review journals that I cited? If they thought it was worthless or irrelevant, why on earth would they do this? The point of the rant was twofold. One, something that has been published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal is not necessarily true nor scientific. Two, something that has not been published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal is not necessarily false nor unscientific. That was it. That was my entire point. It was a response to those silly critics who claim falsely that creationists have zero publications in peer review. With regards to the point I made about Charles Darwin, a theologian who did not publish his theory of evolution in peer review, Donovan Thompson wrote in on YouTube. Darwin published his theory in a peer-reviewed journal. Shortly afterwards, he published his book for the average reader. Thanks for writing in, but that's not quite true. Yes, he revealed some of his theory at the Linnaean Society meeting, but, as Chris Mayer pointed, correctly pointed out on YouTube, Darwin published an extract that contained a portion of a chapter. The rest of the paper were letters and a paper by Wallace. To say that Darwin published his theory in peer review is a long stretch, to say the least. Eek, we are out of time. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now. Remember, you can send in your comments, questions, hate mail, and your family's secret recipes to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com, or you can send us a tweet at genesisweek, or you can head on over to genesisweek.com, which takes you to our YouTube channel. Find the most recent show and post a comment there. Or you can post a comment on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash genesisweektv. Remember those words of warning from our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you next week. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjubi.org donations, and thank you for your support. Mm -hmm.